Lord Mayor. Thank you for the invitation. It's always nice to be in Southern California and great to be here in UCLA. So my talk is uh, J about JT, JK Tidal Boyne Gravity in the Sitter Space. And as uh, some of you know, there's been a lot of interest in, in uh, JT gravity. Uh, most of it has been in anti Sitter Space. Uh, so I thought I'd tell you about the Sitter Space, which we've been working on. And, um, you know, this inner space is much more confusing. We understand it much less well, but of course it's uh, much more interesting from the point of view of the real world. Uh, so even though this will be a two dimensional model, very simple, uh, we hope it can teach us something of interest and moreover something of interest, hopefully that will carry over to uh, more complicated higher dimensional examples. So this is work with my student, Kanu Nanda, who's finishing this year, and Sunil Sake, who's a postdoc now in Japan, and based on some earlier work I, I did with others too. Um, so as you know, there are many conceptual questions in co uh, quantum cosmology. When you try to apply quantum mechanics to the universe as a whole, what is even the meaning of the wave function uh, of the universe? Uh, there's no external observer. Uh, who can do experiments uh, and, and uh, you know, figure out the consequences of such a wave function. So what does it mean? How do you interpret it? As I said, this is tied to the question of who are the observers and then what are observables? Um, and all of these questions are then tied to what are acceptable wave functions? Um, you know, what are the criteria? Um, how many of them are there? How much of choice is there, etc. So there's a huge set of questions we have a poor understanding of when we turn to trying to apply uh, quantum mechanics to the universe as a whole. And that was partly our motivation of, of trying to do things in a very simple setting. Maybe I'll just stand this side. Now, I won't attempt to answer all of these questions in generality and provide a firm foundation conceptually for quantum cosmology. Rather, just study some of these questions in some detail, which I think we can do in this very simple 2D example. Um, now, one of the questions in particular we'd like to uh, focus on in this talk uh, is called the problem of time. And uh, not, of course, I'll run out of time by the time I explain this. But anyway, just to say, you know, in, 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 a, in a theory of gravity, um, time is a, is a coordinate. And if, if the wave function is uh, coordinate independent, gauge invariant uh, rather, uh, then um, it uh, cannot uh, change under the change of just a coordinate transformation, which is a gauge transformation. Oh, yeah, I missed this slide. Uh, is a label, coordinate time is a label for events. Nothing physical dep can depend on how you choose to label these events, um, which means uh, two different ways of labeling should, should not cause any physical difference. And that means in the quantum theory that the wave function for a physical state must be invariant under time reparameterizations and also space reparameterizations. Well, uh, on the other hand, clearly uh, the wave function, especially in cosmology, should depend on some physical notion of time. That's probably the most striking thing uh, about that wave function. And so the question is, how does such a notion of physical time arise given that, you know, vis-a-vis -vis coordinate time, the wave function is invariant? And this issue is called the problem of time. And the general thinking is that physical time must be some physical degree, internal degree of freedom in the system. For example, in our universe, you may say, okay, it's the, the scale factor of the universe or the temperature of the microwave background, which serves as the physical clock. And then the problem of time refers to finding such a uh, degree of freedom, which can satisfactorily play the role of physical time that is represent a good clock. Um, and having found such a degree of freedom, uh, what we have to do to understand uh, the quantum mechanics is, so choose that internal degree of freedom, regard it as a physical uh, notion of time, and then construct the Hilbert space of states for that instant of physical time, you know, which is what we do, say, if we work in the semi-classical theory. Um, define inner products, a norm, etc., in that Hilbert space and operators, 
and then understand how to compute their expectation values. So what I'm getting at here is that there's something we have to do conceptually different when we come to cosmology, which is in trying to construct a Hilbert space among the physical degrees of freedom, promote one to a rather special uh, you know, uh, role, uh, call it the physical clock and construct you know, a Hilbert space for the other degrees of freedom um, at given instances of this chosen uh, clock. Okay, uh, so, um, so, 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 and then if such a clock exists or if it exists satisfactorily in some epoch, then you have, then one hopes to recover conventional quantum mechanics um, in that epoch or maybe for the entire history. So, so this is the kind of issue. Um, and also it's important to ask, uh, can a classical limit arise, say at late time, like our universe, or does such a classical limit never arise? Uh, do you always continue to have interference between different branches, etc., cetera, uh, as the universe evolves? So these are all some of the issues. Um, and um, you might put various criteria. You might say, I want such a Hilbert space. I want states with, uh, you know, with a finite norm, uh, finite expectation values, good classical limit. How many of them are there? Or relax some of them, as you'll see, and then ask how many of them there are. So this is the kind of question one would like to explore as one tries to understand quantum uh, gravity in, in a cosmological context. So, um, and hopefully I'll come to this at the very end in what we learn here, as I said, could have implications in higher dimensions too. Okay, so with that introduction, here is JT gravity in two dimensions, in the sitter space, uh, there's, there are two fields, the dilaton and, and the metric. Um, and the action is like this, the dilaton multiplies the Ricci scalar minus the cosmological constant, which is positive. There's also a boundary term, which I'm not writing down. Newton's constant is denoted as Gn. It is dimension less in two dimensions because this is uh, D2x and R, as you know, has two derivatives. So that makes G Newton dimensionless. Uh, the cosmological constant has dimensions of mass square. And I'm just, this is the only scale in the problem. So I'm going to set it to uh, some value which conventionally is taken to be two. Okay, so that's the theory. It's very simple. Um, um, and uh, one other thing to point out is that, you know, uh, so G Newton plays the role of H bar. It sits in the denominator. And the classical limit is G Newton going to zero. As you can see, equivalently, since we could have taken the G Newton and put it here, it's really phi over G Newton going to zero. I'm sorry, going to infinity if G Newton goes to zero, phi over G Newton going to infinity. So another way to say it is phi can go to infinity. Okay, so it's really that ratio, but. Um, uh, so, in, oftentimes, I'll just set G Newton to 1, we can reinstate it, and then the classical limit will be, um, will be 5 going to infinity. Okay, now actually in the theory, there is an additional parameter. Um, this might be familiar to many of you if when we do string uh, world sheet perturbation theory. Here we are talking about space-time, but just to say, on the world sheet, there's an extra parameter which counts the genus. Uh, or weights different uh, genus uh, differently. And there's a similar parameter here in this theory, uh, which weights the different topologies by different uh, you know, amounts. Um, um, but I won't, uh, what we'll mostly do in this talk, except at the very end, if time permits, is to work with a fixed topology, to work with the topology of a single boundary in space, uh, or rather uh, to work with a single universe, not multiple universes. Uh, which gets very confusing, uh, especially in the canonical framework. And that means we are suppressing topology change, okay, in this talk. And then we can come back and ask what will happen if we include it. Okay, so JT, uh, I should also mention that this two-dimensional theory can be obtained by dimensional reduction of a near extremal black hole geometry in four-dimensional Isidro space. This is a little bit akin to how JT gravity in ADS can arise from the near horizon limit of a near extremal black hole in ADS space or even flat space. Um, 
So here, if you take, uh, there's, a ex near, there's an extremal black hole in the sitter space, it's called the Nariai solution, where the cosmological and the black hole horizons come very close together. And if you take a suitable limit of that, then you get JT gravity in the sitter space. And the dilaton I was uh, talking about is the radius of the two sphere in that case. Okay. Um, now, as I said, this is a very simple, you could say laughably simple theory. Uh, there are no local propagating degrees of freedom. The you know, there are no gravitons in two dimensions and, um, and so on. So it's a very, very simple theory. Yet, you know, many of the conceptual questions I, I mentioned when we started are present here as well. Uh, how do you uh, choose uh, a good clock? How do you uh, think about what are observables and so on and so forth? And one can hope to address some of them in this simpler setting, shown off all the complications pertaining to the UV that arise, for example, if you have gravitons and so on. Okay. Um, and the idea we'll explore is that the dilaton, uh, which will evolve as the universe evolves, uh, will play the role of the physical clock. So, you know, we will say that we are at a particular instant of physical time if the dilaton takes some value. This is actually similar, as, as you know, to what happens in inflation in the early universe. There we have a scalar field, the inflaton, which evolves. And one way to think about physical time in that context is what value that inflaton is at. And you can compute uh, the inflationary perturbations you know, these perturbations, as you know, which have been seen are a scalar mode. They are not tensor modes. They are not quantum, they're not due to quantum fluctuations of uh, gravity, uh, of uh, gravitons, but rather there's a scalar mode whose origin is the fact that you have a clock in the inflaton, but it's not a perfect clock. It has quantum jitter. In it. Okay. And so here we'll explore a sort of similar idea. Our context is much simpler. Instead of the inflaton, we'll have a dilaton the scalar, but again, its values will denote epochs of time in the cosmology. And we'll be interested in asking what happens at large values of this dilaton, kind of like what we ask in the universe at late times as measured by some clock like uh, the inflaton, although of course uh, that clock is not useful after inflation ends. Okay, so with this introduction, I'll now turn to canonically quantizing JT gravity. That's what most of the talk is about. Then we'll discuss some of these issues. What are what are the uh, how to think about physical? What are the physical states which meet all the constraints? How do you define a norm? Expectation values for operators and so on. And then uh, end with some conclusion comments. And a question. So, yeah. so even outside the semi-classical regime, you think the dilaton is like a, a good clock, or even even show that? I mean, there's always some sort of possibility, kind of like fluctuates sort of backwards in time and so on. But yeah. in general, it's hard to, um, that there are even some theorems or something about the impossibility of having good clocks. Um, but uh, are you, you're gonna demonstrate that it is a good clock? So, well, what we'll do is we'll first of all solve the constraints uh, without, uh, you know, requiring that there be any kind of clock. Just solve the gauge constraints and obtain all the states. And in, then you'll see that in those states, the dilaton will appear as a degree of freedom. So we'll try to think of then a, a, a notion of a, a vector space at constant values of the dilaton and, and try to define norms and so on. Now what will happen is depending on the kind of state one is dealing with, the norm one defines, which is sort of the natural norm, as you'll see, a kind of klein gordon norm, that norm is not always conserved. You know, it's um, conserved maybe sufficiently late when you're more in the classical era. And so you could take the view that, you could take two views that, you know, you have a departure from quantum mechanics here, or you don't have a satisfactory clock, you know. Um, but at least, and then you could go ahead and explore whether there's in any other kind of satisfactory clock. Uh, which we haven't haven't done. Um, or you could say, well, I'm just going to use this clock and say conventional quantum mechanics sets it later. But there'll be other states, which actually I don't understand as well, but there are, they are there. There's a very large class of them where uh, there's no such breakdown, you know, where the dilaton seems to provide a good notion of time, uh, physical time, going far back also. 
So, but what we'll do is not, not be tied to any clock as such when we solve the gauge plane strengths to begin with, but then try to understand the solutions. That's right. Um, so just to get it right, like the for you, is a dynamical degree of freedom yes. or it's just... It's a dynamical degree of freedom, but then at some point you have to decide how to construct a, a space of states, you know, and that requires you to choose some notion of time, you know. So, but it, we'll quantize it with its fluctuations and so on. Okay. Um, so here, here is, let's start with the classical solutions. Uh, this is global dissider space. I've written it in these coordinates, um, R and X, and the dilaton. Uh, so X is, uh, R is, you know, this has signature minus, the GRR is minus, so this is like a time coordinate. Uh, and this is a spatial coordinate. We'll work uh, with spatial coordinates being compact. I'll take x to go from 0 to 2 pi. And in these coordinates, the dilaton evolves uh, with time. It's independent of x. Uh, and um, it can take any value uh, for, for global de sitter. Um, and uh, any, let's say we, we make a choice and we say any positive value. Uh, so now, more general solutions, if you were to write the most general set of solutions, it's a very simple theory, so you can just write them down. Um, they have one more parameter. There was a parameter that entered in the dilaton in the previous slide. There's one more parameter, little m. This little m took the value minus one for global dissider, but actually you can take any value and you still solve the equations of motion, any value from minus infinity to infinity. And so you have a two parameter uh, worth of solutions uh, which is to say a two-dimensional phase space in this system. So it's a very, very simple theory. Um, the M greater than a zero solution, okay, yeah. Oh yeah, here we go. The uh, M equal to minus one was global. Other negative values of M uh, correspond, oh, this was the, I should have said this. This is a Penrose diagram of, of global de Sitter space. Some of you might have seen the diagram of uh, Penrose diagram of de Sitter to be a square, and that's true in higher dimensions, but in two dimensions, because you don't have a sphere, you have only a circle uh, besides time. Uh, the, it's a rectangle with the circle going from say zero to two pi, okay? And other values of M correspond to changing the aspect ratio of, of this rectangle. You can make it, you know, longer along, the length uh, along, along the y direction or, or longer along the x direction. So these are all, um, uh, all of the m less than one solutions, m less than zero solutions. Little m greater than zero can be thought of as orbifolds of black hole solutions. So here is a black hole solution in, in the set of space. Uh, you have a square and another square with singularities. If you started from the past infinity, you could cross a horizon shown in blue, which is the cosmological horizon, then cross another horizon, which is a black hole horizon, and end up in the future singularity, or you could start in the past singularity and make your way out into the future space-like infinity. Uh, and what we're doing is since you're gonna keep, and the X coordinate is, is like a Milne coordinate uh, in, in this diagram. Okay, once we make X to be compact, you take some orbifold region shown in the cross hatched, uh, sh shown, shown with the cross hatch here, and keep this region. Um, and so you have a kind of uh, time like orbifold singularity here that you might worry about. And we'll just go ahead and quantize the theory anyway and see what it does. Um, okay, so this is, this is, these are all the classical solutions. Last thing to say is asymptotically, the size of the universe grows linearly with this radial coordinate r, uh, say I take this, um, asymptotically the size of the universe along the spatial direction goes linearly with r, the dilaton goes linearly with r, so the length over the dilaton goes to some constant and that constant will appear, um, maybe, I'm not sure now how I arrange the slides as we go along, so just keep that in mind. Okay. Um, now, you know, uh, when you do the dimensional reduction 
this uh, gelatin is related to the, I said, the, the, the area of the two sphere, and that area can't become less than zero from the four dimensional point of view, but we have, we've truncated the theory. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, we won't impose any condition on the gelatin's range. Uh, we'll see what the quantum theory tells us. Um, and intuitively, you might think we should take the dilaton to be greater than or equal to zero, which is roughly what we have in mind. But we'll go ahead and solve the constraints and so on anyway, and then see what picture emerges. Okay, so now we are on to canonical quantization. Um, and here I'll follow actually uh, the discussion in a very early and uh, beautiful paper by Hano, which goes back to 1985, and which was also discussed by these authors, Elias Q. Krutov, uh, Turiachi, and Valende, but really it goes back to Heno, um, and we'll follow that, and then we'll explore where that takes us. So we'll work in AD and gauge. I'll set the lapse function equal to uh, one, the shift function here, N1 equal to zero, and uh, then uh, in this gauge, you can work out the canonical momenta, so there's a momentum for the dilaton and the the only remaining metric component I'm calling G1. It's GXX, if you like, but I just didn't want to keep writing GXX. So, um, so you know, uh, there are these canonical momenta and they become these functional derivatives acting on the wave function, which is actually a functional of the dilaton and metric fields. Okay, so they are standard quantization. And now we come to the e equations of motion, if you like for the lapse and shift functions, which are the Hamiltonian and momentum constraints. And what we want to do is impose that these two operators, these two constraints annihilate all physical states. Okay, this is like how you do quantization of gauge theories in say A0 equal to zero gauge. The equation of motion of A0, which is Gauss's law, still needs to be imposed on all states. So this is the analog of that. Now, the problem is that these constraints are actually not well defined when we come to the quantum theory. For example, if you take the, the, the Hamiltonian constraint is also called the wheeler david equation. So if you take the Hamiltonian constraint, you have, you know, for example, you have G1, square root of G1, and pi G1, but they don't commute, of course, so it could have been in another order. And, uh, you know, you have to decide which order it is if you're trying to quantize. And you'll see that this becomes very important if you go to early, to the early universe where the dilaton takes small values. If you're at, in the semi-classical region, which, which coincides, as I was saying, to late values of the dilaton, then these ordering ambiguities will not matter. You'll be in the WKB regime, but they're important uh, when the universe is actually early on in the universe's history, when the dilaton is small, or it'll turn out when it has small size. Okay, so we have to do something about this, but there's another uh, ambiguity here, which is um, even beyond ordering, and uh, that ambiguity has to do with um, the fact that there are actually UV divergences uh, because the Hamilton, and this is this that, that's true. The, the ordering ambiguities are also true in the momentum constraint here because it has say G one and pi G one again, but. The wheeler david uh, constraint is, has an ambiguity which is not present here, which has to do with the fact that there are two momenta, uh, say in this case of the dilaton and the metric, which are both present. Now, if I'm working with wave functions and trying to, or wave functionals and trying to impose these constraints, each of these is a functional derivative. Acting on a functional, a functional derivative gives a normal function, but then another one at the same location, I should have said this is at every location x, the pi of phi at x, g1 of x, etc. So another another functional derivative at the same location acting on a function will give you a delta zero, you know. And so you have to try and make sense of that. So these are the kinds of ambiguities. Um, it, it gives a delta zero type of singularity. So these are the kind of ambiguities you have to deal with. And we'll follow uh, the procedure that Heno wrote down, and then come back to why we think it's a good one by comparing with the path entity. So we take one linear combination. This is one way to describe how to deal with the constraints. Having understood it like this, you can go back and phrase it in terms of what to do with these the delta zero divergence and the orderings. But let me describe it like this. Classically, you take one combination 
and it turns out you can organize some linear combination to be of this form so that it only depends on the momentum conjugate to G1. And this has two branches for its solutions. And so you say, look, I'm going to impose instead of both of those Hamiltonian momentum constraints, this linear combination or this one, rather more correctly, this one, let's say, and one of the two original constraints. Okay, it turns out the momentum constraint. So, so the, here we've made various choices. The delta function, the delta zero singularity, if you take the square root, has gone away. We've also chosen to order things in some way in the manipulations which lead to this linear combination and so on. Um, and so, but, but we can do that. And so bottom line, we impose this condition and the momentum constraint instead of the Hamiltonian and the momentum constraint. Now, you know, when I solve this condition, uh, when I solve that, took the linear combination and solved, an integration constant appears, m. And uh, so in our solutions to the physical states, we will have one parameter um, and a dependence on the dilaton, et cetera, as you would see. And this constant will be pretty important and if you were to just do it classically, I would introduce these two parameters. You may recall little m and a, capital M is related to them like this. So if this was positive and you were dealing with those orbifolds or black holes, that would be positive M. If this was negative, so you had global, uh, global DS or those other changes in aspect ratio uh, compared to the global case, then this would be negative because M was negative. So just, just to keep in mind, not too important. Okay, so we impose this condition and, and we impose the momentum constraint. And it turns out that uh, it's very simple then to solve for all physical wave functions, a little bit complicated, but you know, trivial compared to the full complexity. And you get some answer, it's not so important. But then, because uh, we've, um, uh, so it solves, you can show that you, know, you, you get a solution to all the constraints. Uh, and so we are actually done. You know, the solution is a bit complicated, but this is the full set of all gauge invariant states speci uh, specified uh, by uh, M. So really for every value of this integration constant, you get a gauge invariant state. And actually there are two of them because you can have two branches. It'll turn out that these will correspond to expanding and contracting analysis. Um, so this is the full solution. Now, since you have already solved the, the constraints, having done so, you can, including the, the Wheeler-Divitt constraint, what the, what the Wheeler-Divitt constraint tells you is that the system is invariant vis-a-vis -vis changing your notion of coordinate time, which means you can move your spatial slice up and down locally by changing the time location of each point on that slice. Um, and since you've already ensured that the physical state is invariant under that, we can what we can do is choose uh, a notion of, uh, of a spatial slice so that the dilaton takes a constant value along it. Okay, so what I'm trying to say here is this is the general, this is the general result for the wave function uh, as a function of x, which tells you where you are on the spatial slice uh, and depends on how the dilaton is varying and how the metric is varying. Should be a comma here. Uh, but now I can choose a slice. I can choose to look at a slice where the dilaton is constant. If the slice wasn't such a one to begin with, I can move it up and down uh, to, to take the dilaton to be constant on it, okay? So let's do that. And then the same formula simplify a great deal and they only depend on, on the value of the dilaton, which is constant on this slice. And the remaining geometry that can characterize such a slice, but you know, in, in one, one spatial dimension, the only thing which can enter, there's only geometrical quantity is the length of the circle, okay, the size of the units. So the, the solutions become very, very simple. Uh, two branches, depends on the value of the dilaton uh, that uh, instant of time on that slice and the length of this universe or the length of the circle uh, when the dilaton is taking value, fine. So, so these are solutions carry for every value of m. Uh, the most general solution then is just a sum over all solutions with arbitrary uh, coefficient functions. Okay, so this is it. Um, and um, now we can go ahead and just explore the consequences of, of this most general set of gauge invariant solutions. Maybe I'll pause here.
So you are collating your slides of space time such that you have these constant dilaton surfaces, right? Right. So that is if that becomes let's say your constant physical time surfaces. Yes. But on a on each such slice, the coordinate times can be different. Yeah, 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 in depending on which coordinate system you are, that's correct. Like that's so correct. It's like one physical time after the next. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. How do you not know that the constant delta time slice was somehow it's not always sort of space like in the yeah you know, I, I, yeah th th this is a good question. Uh, how how do you know that? Well, in all the classical solutions, that was the case, so we thought it was reasonable. But it could be that there are quantum fluctuations where there, that's not necessarily true. And um, I'm not fully sure how to answer that because you can solve the gauge constraints more generally, as I was saying. Um, and now one would have to go back and look at the quantum solutions to decide if there was an obstruction. Well, and this might be connected to, so you haven't discussed at this point any like inner product on the yeah the space of wave functions, but you one might worry that you sort of you're neglected part of the yeah, Hilbert space or something like that. But, yeah. But but I guess if you can ultimately find a good inner product or something, then you can yeah. justify it. Yeah. No, no, that's a good question. Uh, what we'll do is we will be able to define an inner product. Uh, it won't always lead to a norm which is conserved for all values of the dilaton. So you might, and you will see that the the leakage, if it happens, happens from universes of size going to zero. Um, and roughly the the point is that the Wheeler David equation, you know, you have to be careful uh, because you have a boundary in the in in the length direction, uh, you know, is not self adjoint or whatever when you're trying to quantize like this. Um, and um, okay, so maybe you know if you were to do go beyond a single universe canonical quantization, that leakage of flux is telling you something. Um, but at least it didn't reveal any indication of uh, some issue with the dilaton being chosen to be a function of time. So let me just say yes, we, we sort of make that assumption. It's based on the fact that at least classically. Uh, this was true for all solutions, but it is an assumption. That's true. Mm, okay, so um, so here, here's the solution. Um, now, more precisely, actually, I haven't. The more correct version of the solution is that you know, uh, let's say I'm starting with any value of m. Then, uh, if the dilaton is small, say if m is positive, if phi square is smaller than m, then the square root will change sign. And uh, you, in fact, get two solutions then, which are exponentially growing or being suppressed. And uh, so the more general full class of solutions is, is that you have the oscillatory ones when phi square is bigger than m for positive m. If m is negative, then that's not an issue. And then from phi square to infinity, you have these, I'm <clears throat> sorry, exponentially suppressed or growing branches. And continuity, uh, of the wheeler devitt equation uh, across uh, phi square equal to m uh, for any solution uh, teaches you uh, that there's a relation between these various coefficients. We are shortly going to define a norm such that the exponentially growing solutions are, are non-normalizable. So I'm just going to throw them away, a choice I can make, and then there'll be a continuity condition which relates rho and rho tilde, the coefficients in the expanding and Actually, this is the expanding and the contracting branches to the exponentially decaying branch, the part of the wave function. Okay, so now this is the full solution. Um, now we have implicitly made all kinds of choices when we uh, uh, solve the constraint equations, as I said, and you may worry, uh, was this a good thing to do? Was this a, a, a consistent thing to do? And so on. So there is one sanity check which we can do on the whole procedure, which is that one can try to relate what we did in canonical quantization to the path integral. Um, and the path integral can be done for the hartle hawking wave function. As you know, there's a, a rather nice wave function in the context of uh, cosmology, particularly in the sitter space, which has been discussed which is to uh, think of the universe 
uh, as being born from as a kind of Euclidean uh, instant on out of nothing, uh, um, which I'll describe a little bit. Um, and uh, so that it's, the, the instant on is completely smooth uh, and shrinks to zero as a sphere. I'll tell you a little bit about that. So there's a well-known state like this corresponding to a no boundary uh, proposal, which is called the Hartle-Hawking state. And it turns out that this is such a simple theory that you can do the path integral, which is involved, because this state is described in path integral language. You can do the path integral exactly. Uh, it turns out that it's one loop exact. This fact was, was known in ADS space, but it's actually true that uh, the, the continuation from ADS to DS also preserves this feature, okay? And one can look at it in various ways, um, uh, but it, it turns out to be true. So we know the exact answer and uh, we can com compare it with the uh, result we obtain in canonical quantization. And it's rather important to know the answer beyond the semi-classical approximation, because in all these choices we made about normal ordering and or rather about factor ordering and so on, they won't show up in the uh, semi-classical limit. So since we know this answer exactly, it's a rather good check, if only for this one state um, of, the, of the procedure. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Okay, and here is what the wave function looks like for the Hartle-Hawking state in the kind of language I was using. This is just the expanding branch of the wave function. So you produce the universe out of a Euclidean instant on, match it onto the Lorentzian Decida geometry, and then it just expands uh, exponentially. And it has this uh, expanding branch and this coefficient we were uh, discussing, which takes the form sine hyperbolic two pi square root of m. Actually, there's a coefficient in front, which I've suppressed, but up to that coefficient, some normalization constant, if you like, it's sine hyperbolic two pi root m, which might be familiar because this is also the density of states of black holes in ADS JT gravity. So I'll come back to that a little bit as we go along. Uh, sorry for this bad diagram, but this is the conventional way to think about the hartle hawking state. In this case, you have a two sphere, we are in two dimensions. You chop the sphere at, at the equator, uh, which is a moment of uh, Euclidean time, let's say symmetry, and then you glue it onto the Lorentzian geometry. It turns out that in, in, in this very simple theory of two dimensions, there's actually another way to, uh, to also uh, think about this uh, instant on, which is to start with, Sounds a bit strange, but it actually makes good sense. We've examined it at the level of determinants with matter and so on, which is to start with anti dissider space with two time-like directions, and then continue one of the time-like directions to space to get dissider. Uh, sounds very fishy to begin with, two time-like directions, but actually because it's such a simple theory, turned out you can evaluate all determinants and so on and so forth, and even with matter and it makes sense. So, okay, there are these two ways. Anyway, the, I think the path integral is, I would say, in good control. You can check when you do the analytic continuations where singularities are and avoid them and go from ADS to DS and so on. Uh, so it seems to me to be under good control. So we have a good understanding from the path integral of the state. Never mind, I'll skip some details. And, and therefore, uh, we, I think we can trust the wave function. Now again, um, like I was saying, this was the part I wrote down, but if you allow for, if you include the, the part which is uh, suppressed, uh, then you get a uh, exponentially suppressed part. Okay, so this is the full wave function and, um, um, and this agrees and this gives us a lot of confidence that the canonical quantization we are trying to do, the choices we made are sensible. They actually at least agree with the, the path integral that I've described. I should say that even the path integral we've described has choices. There's a particular contour which is used for the dilaton and so on and so forth, like in ADS, if you know uh, how the JT theory has been solved, but the two at least are consistent. So that's a check. Um, and um, okay, I think I've already told you all about here. So, so this, is, this, is the, this is the story. Um, and um, 
just to say, you know, there's an approximation which has often been used in quantum cosmology called the mini super space approximation. And what people do here is rather because, you know, you're dealing with more complicated situations, say in four dimensions or something is first reduce the problem to say a spherically symmetric one and then quantize. And you're going to try to do that here also, reduce it just to a circularly symmetric one and then quantized and so on. And it turns out what you get is something similar, but a little different, which is if you just first reduce to the circularly symmetric case, you would have found that your, oh, I'm sorry, the psi should have been outside. You find that the wheeler david equation, uh, so now you're first reducing to everything being constant along the spatial slices, satisfies an equation dl d phi plus phi l acting on psi is zero. Whereas what you actually get is something very similar, going through the more careful procedure, but making the choices we did, which is this equation is satisfied, but not by psi, but by psi hat, which is one over L psi. Okay, and at small L, when the universe is small and things are more quantum, that makes a difference. Um, okay, just to say, so okay, now let's turn to constructing the full set of space, uh, states and trying to uh, see with the dilaton as time what we get. Um, and as, so now, you know, the wave function is, uh, we've chosen these nice slices where the dilaton is constant and the wave function, psi or psi hat, never mind, depends on the length of the universe. And the dilaton will take this to be time and then think of this wave function as telling us what is the amplitude at this physical time for the universe to have some size. Okay, that's all that there is as dynamical degrees in this very simple theory. Okay, and then try to see what we learn. So, um, so let's go ahead. Now you see because um, psi hat satisfies something like a klein gordon equation, as you can see, there's a natural norm that is suggested, which is a klein gordon like norm. And that's the norm we are going to explore. Um, and so that is the norm which comes out in terms of psi hat. I could have like, written it in terms of psi uh, to differ by one over L, as I was saying. So this is a this is a, a natural norm to consider. Um, you can ask, but the integral over L, as I was saying, goes from zero to infinity. You can't have negative sizes for the universe, so that's an important constraint, and uh, that results in some condition that the wave function has to satisfy at L equal to zero. And of course, also there's some condition at L equal to infinity, but uh, that one we are already meeting by taking it to be exponentially decaying like we did. So, so this is the condition. It's a little bit like saying no probability can leak out at L equal to zero from universes which are of very small size. Richard, are you anything about the sign of the Van Gordon norm thing? <laughs> Yeah, okay, good. So th that's an important issue. So the sign of the klein gordon norm can be either positive or negative. And it will turn out, if you make one definite choice, then either the expanding branch will have a positive norm or the, the contracting branch will have a positive norm. And so then you have to think about what this means. Well, one thing you could do is say, I'm just going to work with the expanding branch of the wave function, of the set of wave functions, and try to deal define a norm there. Um, um, well, of course, in general, the universe would have both branches, in which case, at least at late, we'll do some cases, if you have wave packets, in many cases, the two branches will decohere and stop interfering with each other. So then you could still go ahead and define this norm, you know, with good approximation at late enough times. But otherwise, as you say, the fact that we have positive and negative norm states for the klein garden is an issue. You might say this is a hint that we should be third quantizing the theory, you know, going to the many particle version, um, which may be the case, but okay, we didn't think about that. So um, that's right. So this is an issue. Thank you. Uh, I should have mentioned that. Um, but this was pretty much the only norm we could define. If we try to do other things, then they're not even conserved in any one branch and so on. So, uh, so this was sort of the best game in town, but you're right, it has this issue when you have both branches present, yeah. Okay, so I'll wrap up not too, too much more. Uh, so, so now, you know, you can then go ahead and define uh, various expectation values, for example, for the length of the universe as a function of the dilaton or the momentum conjugate uh, to, to the length and so on. Um, there are only a few degrees of freedom. And so those can all be defined. 
But of course, uh, whether they are finite or not, that depends on how the wave function uh, behaves. It may be okay that the norm is conserved, no leakage of probability, but then when you compute some of these other objects, they may blow up. So, but you can define them at least and then examine the behavior of states. And uh, I'll sort of not go through everything, but just to say that if you require a conserved norm, um, which is finite, uh, you have a cut down. So not all states are, are allowed. And if you have, uh, if you want to, not only that the norm should be positive, but the probability density for the universe at a given value of the dilaton to have some size, this should be positive or that various expectation values are finite. That further cuts down on, on the states. Um, and it's not clear, just to go back to the uh, beginning of, of the talk, what are all the physical conditions you want to put? You know, um, because we don't have a clear sense of what is the meaning of this wave function. Uh, but anyway, mathematically, you can say, let me impose all of these conditions, you know, conserve norm, um, uh, finite expectation values, and so on. And it turns out even after that, you have left an infinite cl class of solutions because to begin with, you had this continuous family of solutions. There's a cut down, it imposes some conditions on the coefficients, but you still have an infinite set of linearly independent solutions that you're left with. Um, and they are of you know, they have interesting features. Um, uh, okay, you can also impose that you get a classical limit, etc. cetera. And, and you know, even with all that, you have a huge class of solutions. Um, not all of, so then you, you know, you can examine them. Um, so this leaves many, uh, an infinite number. You can examine their properties and so on. I'll just give you some examples for what happens. Um, so uh, for example, you can consider wave, wave packets and um, uh, these wave packets can be such that they do have a good classical limit at, at late enough times that is large enough values of dilaton. They look something like this. And uh, so L over phi, if you remember in the classical solutions, both the size of the universe and the dilaton were growing at the same rate, the ratio was constant, and that's what comes out here. Um, and it's a good classical state if this variance in the Gaussian wave packet, which you can input, is, is big enough. So you have classical states, you have non-classical states, which don't become classical even at late time, because there are large fluctuations in various expectation values, which arise. You can also have states which have interference between uh, the different branches, uh, two expanding branches, uh, uh, two, two classical, each wave packet is a classical solution by itself, but they continue to interfere with each other, or a contracting and expanding branch which interferes, which I understand even less well um, in the universe. Okay, so, so there's a bunch of states, um, we understand them. Um, you have perfectly sensible states in that you know, they have a good classical limit, conserved norm, and so on, but you have some which don't meet all those criteria. And some of them which don't meet some of these criteria are interesting in their own right. I'll tell you a little bit about them. Um, now, interestingly, the hartle hawking wave function turns out to be uh, not the best behaved in the sense that the norm of the hartle hawking wave function diverges. Uh, one way to see that is that this is the full solution this part, you know, the coefficient function was growing exponentially like root m. Uh, the decay factor is growing like down, is decaying down as e to the minus l root m, say for some fixed value of the dilaton. So if l is bigger than two pi, then the wave function is, you know, then this integral converges, but if l is smaller than two pi, then it diverges. And l equal to two pi is actually um, the, 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 the value of that sphere where you map match the Euclidean solution to the uh, Minkowski one. So the, the hartle hawking wave function is not, uh, doesn't have a finite norm. There are many other states that do. Uh, so that suggests that at least we should look at them. This is not to say that one should discard the hartle hawking wave function, because let's say we had matter present, then it might mean you can't compute the expectation value for the universe to have some fixed size when the dilaton takes some value. That might require this norm to be finite, but if you just say, I'm going to calculate some other conditional probabilities, like if the dilaton has some value and the universe has some size, what are the matter fluctuations? So, you know, since we don't understand exactly what are the physical observables, it might be too early to discard it. 
but it's at least worth keeping in mind that there are other states which are, if anything, even better behaved. And now I'm coming to the end of the talk, but I, I've not talked about including matter, but just to say, using path integral means you can include matter even for some states, uh, you know, for various states, and you'll see it actually makes a difference uh, in, in terms of the matter perturbations, whether you have a hartle hawking state or some other state. So, uh, or, or there's a state dependent. So, so, you know, other states are worth taking into account in a serious way, at least in these simple models. Um, okay, so um, let me also just say a few more things. Uh, so maybe I'll just, um, just try to conclude and say, okay, number of allowed physical states is infinite. Um, the the Sita entropy, which I didn't talk much about, is finite if you think of a dimensional reduction. So you may say, what's going on? How come you found an infinite number of uh, physical states here? And I don't have a clear answer other than, you know, we suppress topology change, just to go back to the start of the talk. And the parameter, so there was this parameter, which was, if you, if you were to allow for topology change in the path integral, there's a parameter here, uh, which is tied to the Sita entropy as seen from four dimensions. So we are really taking this parameter to go to infinity in suppressing topology change. Maybe that's why we are finding an infinite number of states. Maybe we need to include topology change to see this cut down. I don't know, but at least the canonical quantization in the single universe sector doesn't show any direct evidence for uh, the the Sita uh, entropy. Uh, although it, it will show some connection with black holes and their entropy in the Sita space, as I'll try to show you. Okay, um, already said everything here. Um, now, it'd be nice to understand some of the other states from a path integral perspective, and we've been able to do that for the cases with positive values of A, to some extent. This is sort of ongoing work, um, but not for the states with negative values of M, which were these different aspect ratio states. So, so that remains an interesting question. Um, um, there is something kind of interesting about the result. Uh, if you ask what is the interpretation of, of this conserved quantity uh, just for classical solutions in terms of charges, it turns out that there is a momentum. So as you know, uh, in, in the center, the boundary is, is space-like, and you can define a momentum, a brown York kind of uh, momentum charge at the future space-like boundary. And uh, that is related to these quantities I was talking about, uh, which were both conserved. Um, and so, so it's interesting that in a sense, the various states we are finding correspond to having different values of this momentum operator. Since it's a momentum and not an energy, unlike ADS space, it can take both positive and negative values. That's related to why we were finding both positive and negative energy sta uh, states with both positive and negative values of n. Okay, so um, um, let me just say, uh, the, the failure to meet some of these conditions is interesting in its own right. Uh, as I was saying, if you take a state which is made out of a linear combination of the orbifold geometries, then uh, it turns out that, um, that uh, if I, with, with the, the mass parameter m taking some finite value, then it turns out that the norm is not exactly conserved, only becomes exactly conserved at a, a late enough time. So there's some kind of a leakage of probability going on here, and its interpretation would be nice to find out, but not in the cases where you have only negative M states. Um, okay, so, so it's interesting. These are examples where you have some kind of a breakdown of conventional quantum mechanics at early times. That can actually persist. You can also have situations where it persists in some exponentially small way, all the way up to late times. So it's interesting to ask, okay, if that happened, or what would be the meaning of, of, of such, such systems where you have this breakdown of conventional quantum mechanics. Okay, so, uh, so the solutions which don't quite have all the properties also uh, teach us something. Now, just to leave you with what we're trying to do now, we have a path integral understanding for some of the other states besides the hartle hawking state, and it turns out that, in fact, um, these states can be related uh, to a matrix. As, as you know, uh, in, in ADS space, 
there is a matrix model which gives uh, the the same results that the path integral do, does, as was shown by South Schenker and Stanford. And because of this close connection that you can, uh, we think that you can ultimately relate the sitter two to minus ADS two, ADS two with two time like directions. Uh, I think that's the underlying reason. These positive M states also have an interpretation in, 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 in the form of this kind of matrix here. This is just what we are finding. And, and so just to say, uh, and this I can describe in private mode, um, think of these states as first, uh, if the M parameter was, was, uh, was taking discrete values as a sum over various values of M, each of which has got this wave function, uh, the hartle hawking state is really a, a special state because it weights all states equally. So it's just a sum, I'm sorry, this should have been an I here. Uh, it just weights all, all terms equally. Um, what happens is in the corresponding matrix model, which is very closely related to the ADS one, um, the sum is actually continuous. So you just see the density of eigenvalues of the matrix. Um, uh, so the matrix theory is, is a Hermitian matrix theory. It's a random matrix theory, and it's got some density of eigenvalues. So uh, the Hartle-Hawking state is just a sum over all states with equal weights. So it's just the integral over the density of states times this wave function, and that accounts for this factor. The other states weight the different states uh, in unequal ways. Uh, you could just choose to take one, element, one eigenvalue of the matrix or some of them and then you get the appropriate coefficient function that we talked about. So this is the kind of interpretation. And um, one advantage of this is uh, you can, you know, we haven't discussed going to the higher topologies, as I said, but if you trust the interpretation, you can use the matrix theory to then try and compute uh, topology changing amplitudes, which one could do in the matrix theory. I haven't described all this very well, but uh, roughly that's the idea that, um, you know, if you try to produce two universes, you compute uh, the correlations between these various coefficient functions. So, so this is what we are trying to do. Um, I think we can put it in solid footing for this entire branch, but it's perplexing that we have this other branch, uh, which uh, which is uh, you know where we have no such uh, no no such interpretation. The other thing to do is that uh, one can literally extend this canonical quantization method to the full dimensionally reduced theory where we didn't truncate to some kind of near horizon region. Turns out to be equally easy. And so we're trying to do that just to see uh, what, one can, what one can learn. And finally, just to show you this, in some cases we can add matter and, and, what one, and compute the matter perturbations. Of course, in this toy model, but they are the analog of the CMB perturbations. And one finds that there are interesting dependencies on the state and so on you start with. So what, what one can do is have some non hartle hawking like state and you get corrections to what would have been the CMB-like spectrum in this very, very, very simple theory. So I think maybe some to summarize, okay, this is a set of toy models and we haven't fully understood uh, the import of everything we have learned, but uh, they can be solved quite explicitly and we hope we learn something here, both by way of connections to non-perturbative descriptions and by way of uh, what we learn in terms of understanding or interpreting the results uh, towards the conceptual questions of quantum gravity as we go along. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. I thought I'd show you this slide and invite you all to TIFR. Of course, you have a beautiful Pacific Sea here close to UCLA. But maybe this will tempt you. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, I was just there, and you have to sneak into a base, and we're going to go to a talk, so it's it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Not the base, but it, it is a, the security has gotten crazy. Yeah. Kind of amazing. Sorry. Um, if, if you think about the dilaton is coming from a topological universe, the metric is coming from a geometric one, and when you add matter, you have the opportunity to think of trivial line bundle as a degree zero Clifford object. Um, so if you have time, the square root of time might make sense as well. What happens if you add matter and then you try to think about uh, the, this concept of time from a 
spinorial perspective. There's always this problem in quantum gravity that if you allow the, the metric to blink out, GL and R double cover doesn't have any interesting finite dimensional representation. So the bosonic bundles remain in place, but the fermionic bundles vanish during periods of metric indeterminacy. <coughs> you learn something, uh, does it remove some of the choices? Uh, are you feeding it back so that you might get something unique or you find something impossible? Has that been? Uh, no, that's a good question. Uh, you know, with matter, we've been able to do very little, which is just compute uh, some analog of, um, let's say we had a contracting universe in the far past and it tunnels to a, a universe in the far future, just compute amplitudes. If you started with some matter state, which can be fermionic or bosonic, uh, to go into uh, find some initial states, to, to go into final states. Some kind of an analog of a, you know, S matrix kind of thing, asymptotic data. And we are not able to do the calculation in the canonical framework or do it in the uh, path integral framework uh, for all time, just asymptotically. It seems to give a, a sensible result uh, in terms of relating the asymptotic data but what it's doing at intermediate times in, in, in uh, along the lines of what you're saying, if you were to you know, construct a set of slices and so on, is less clear. There's some kind of tunneling going on. Uh, the Euclidean answer tells you that, uh, the path integral answer. But exactly how is it dealing with uh, you know, very small, um, at least lengths, let's put it like this, uh, is, is unclear. And uh, was that, that's what you had in mind with your... I, I didn't know. Or, One possibility is that if, if you think about it as a spinorial, you know, like a composite dilaton or something like that, um, you may have to pass through the exterior algebra separating two different yeah. signature Clifford algebras. So you might learn something because you'd have a complex that you couldn't roll up yeah. because there'd be no adjoint operators, but it might make sense at the level of an unrolled Duram or Delbo complex. But the other thing is, you might actually find that there was all, there's like the, the, all of the choices that you're struggling with. There's a unique choice because you're feeding the metric back to the metric because now there, there's nothing that it doesn't come from a geometric side. But when you, when physicists tend to throw in scalars when they're scared because they, 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 it's not part of the geometric part of the model. Uh, it might be worth being bold to see if it picks out one particular set of choices and branches. Yeah. But you're always entitled to people. I haven't. Pardon me? You're always entitled to people. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't thought about it in that language. I roughly see what you're saying, um, but I haven't thought about it in that language. We've certainly not been able to canonically quantize the system properly with matter. Although I think that might be something that can be done going forward, both fermionic and. and might be interesting to take a fermionic square root of time rather than an arithmetic. Right, and and by that you mean what? You mean the dilaton? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah here the system seemed to go allow for. I didn't dwell on it, but allow negative values of the dilaton with no problem. But um, yeah, it's certainly it's certainly something that I, I agree. We should look at more. If we didn't see anything funny here with matter, we might see something and we expect to see something actually. And the physical, not, not that I understand what you're saying better, the physical way to say it is, you know, uh, if, if you think of the gravitational equation with the one over GM and then the, the matter, the gravitational action, and then you have some matter fields which don't see G Newton, then you get the Einstein equations which are obtained by varying this and they go like, you know, normally you'd say, G Newton times the stress and intensity. Now, now G Newton actually physically is G Newton over the dilaton, you know, because the two come together. So when the dilaton goes to zero, there's some big kind of back reaction that would set up. And we expect therefore that the theory with matter will have some very interesting behavior there. So I, I think what you're raising is a very interesting question. We haven't been able to solve it in terms of solving the constraints and so on. Maybe we'll see something very interesting there. All I, as I was saying, I could do is do the asymptotic calculation. You know, that didn't seem to show anything, but it doesn't, it must be hiding something or making choices, which would be nice to understand. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Questions? 
you add let's say some other some more scalars to the scale, and then uh, is it even allowed to take two scalars, which like a couple additional scalars that couple numerically to this background as your physical clock, or don't they obey uh, good properties, let's say like monotonicity or something like that? Yeah. You could you could do that. We haven't explored it. You could have other fields. People have talked about clocks coming from other fields, I mean, from fields in general, which is what we did. So you could try to do that. But generally speaking, the idea is you want to choose a clock which is reasonably classical. You know, so the fact that we have a one over, one over G Newton here might be helping you, uh, but you could do that and. Uh, you could see how differently the system behaves. Like one does not like buy anything. Like this is you are saying that this is the. Uh, at least it might tell you how the underlying quantum description changes depending on which clock you choose or which are better clocks to choose. In a sense that you get a better classical domain out with that choice of clock. Um, we haven't fully quantized the system with the matter. It does not so. help. Let's say you can times when the length scale of the universe is small. That in those times you are saying that it's, it won't make much difference like say, which clock you choose. Um I mean I don't know. We haven't done it. I suspect it might make a difference. It might make a difference, but I'm not sure. Uh, you're using the telecom as a physical clock when it when you're suppressing to all of right? Let's say I don't suppress topologies, then you are not making any. No, even then, you know, uh, to, to construct a notion of a, a vector space of states or a Hilbert space of states, you needed to choose some notion of a physical clock, you know, from the set of solutions, if you want to regard them as. What, when exactly is that important then? That so when, when, I, when I said I want to try and define a norm, I want to try and define expectation values. You know, then you have to say at what instant of time, you know? Yeah. Okay, let's thank Sandeep.